Singer sewing machines, ushered in with the Industrial Revolution and the gold standard for over a hundred years, many of you are probably aware of the 19th and early 20th century beauties that, all within a graceful cast iron body, encapsulated efficiency, neatness, durability, and progression, changing the history of sewing and fashion forever. Not naming names, but from what I've heard, modern sewing machines have a lot to live up to in terms of quality, and the entire industry could be doing better. Anyway, there is a bit of a lesser known class of vintage sewing machines, children's toys in the 20th century, most of which, especially by Singer, are quite sturdy little friends. The collector's community for these machines is pretty big, but information online is less abundant than you'd think, so I wanted to consolidate it a bit in this video, as well as providing insight into them as an owner of four machines. Undoubtedly, after only a couple afternoons of research, I probably missed a lot, so feel free to comment if you know a bit more than I do, and I'll add a section of additional information to the description box. Also, if you learn to sew on one of these, I'd love to hear about it. So I've got four of these friends, three being singers and one being an off-brand. Since there's a lot more history, we'll be focusing on the history of the singers, though I've got a ton of information on this particular Junior Miss machine, including who it belonged to and nearly every piece of packaging, so we'll be going through every machine individually and taking a look at simple repairs, missing pieces, packaging, and things of that nature. The first step Singer took into children's sewing machines was marketing their Model 24 as a children's machine from time to time. It was manufactured from 1888 to the 1940s and was especially popular among milliners, which are hat and accessory makers. Like many early sewing machines, this was a chain stitch machine, even though most other sewing machines had already switched to the standard lock stitch we see today by at least the 1890s. The reason they kept the chain stitch, however, was because of the Model 24's size. These machines were small, and the chain stitch allowed you to sew without a bottom bobbin and many of the other parts found in machines. Due to their durability and versatility, there are approximately 70 variations were marketed as industrial, household, and children's machines. I'll link a couple of sites below, from one of which you can see an ad from 1920 of the Model 24 being marketed for children. Backing up to 1910, where our story really begins, Singer released the Model 20. This machine was made for children, but occasionally marketed for adults and college students as a portable machine, kind of the opposite of the Model 24. This machine became the gold standard for children's sewing machines for much of the 20th century, being produced with only minor changes until the 1950s by Singer, and its design was copied many times by other companies. The mechanics of these cast iron chain stitch machines stayed essentially the same throughout all of their iterations, but what made the 1910 to 1950 Singer Model 20 unique was that all of the moving parts were exposed, something that we haven't typically seen since really early on. Here you can see a video of how the chain stitch mechanism works from under the plate of the machine, and I have to say it's absolutely mesmerizing. If you've seen an early sewing machine with a chain stitch mechanism, I believe Bernadette Banner featured one on her channel recently from the 1870s, it works exactly like that. As you can see, traveling around the machine, turning the hand wheel moves this metal bar which raises a lever, allowing thread to pass through to the tension knob. Then the needle is raised and lowered, creating and catching loops in the mechanism below the plate. The feed dog is moved by the turning of the looper, raising and lowering this plate. When you want to stop sewing, the needle is raised to its highest point to open up that tension lever, some slack is pulled, and once you raise the presser foot and wiggle the fabric around, you get a very neat chain stitch that's knotted itself at the end of the seam. You're able to change the stitch length using this lever onto the plate, and the variation is pretty long for what you'd expect. You were typically supposed to clamp these machines to the table to keep them in place while in use, but since I don't have a suitable table or the clamp, I won't be doing that. They also had a seam gauge, which is one of the commonly missing items. Now, this model I'm showing you right now is the one manufactured from 1926 up until the 50s, but there were several variations between 1910 and 1926, which can help you date your machine if you own one yourself. So, from 1910 to 1914, the hand wheels had four spokes and no threading eyelets or tension disc, similar to some of the variations of the Model 24. Then, from 1914 to 1922, though those numbers may be a little off, the hand wheel was changed to eight spokes and was more similar in design to the 1926 version. 
They also added threading eyelets, but it wasn't until 1922 that the machine was stamped with numbers indicating the order in which to thread it. They also made an electric version called the Singer 22, spelled 20-2, which sounds kind of scary, but I wasn't able to find too much information online, unfortunately. This is how it remained with only packaging changes until the 1950s when the machine underwent its most drastic change. Before we go there though, I'd like to emphasize that this machine and this chain stitch mechanism became standard and iconic of children's sewing machines for the majority of the 20th century. Plenty of knockoffs were made utilizing its mechanical and sometimes even cosmetic design, including a Japanese version made of lead. <laughs> The different looking blue machine I showed you at the beginning of the video is an example of one such copy from the 1940s and 50s, though I hold it to a bit of a higher standard because of the design creativity and the passable quality. Substantially better than some of the cheaper versions I've seen. This next machine was the Singer 2010, or the Singer So Handy, you'll see both names. It's widely known to be the 1950s version of the Singer Model 20, however, I had some trouble locating the original release year. The earliest copyright I could find was in an instructions manual from 1948, so it was probably 1948, but I wouldn't take that as completely factual. In terms of how it looks, it replaces the cast iron body with aluminum, which covers up most of the insides that were exposed before for a more clunky but still attractive appearance. It also replaces the Singer seal decal on the back with a metal plate on the front, and some of the pieces are shaped slightly differently. This one came in several colors, the standard black, a tan crinkle finish, and extremely rare blue and red versions. Be careful if you're scrolling through eBay and see a colored one though, because people spray paint black versions and pass them off as rare. Besides in looks, it's pretty similar to the previous model. Most of the parts function in the exact same manner, so there's not too much to discuss there. Later on, they changed the design of the electric version to be a lot more plasticky in 1960s, and you'll see plenty of those floating around. What I find most interesting about the Singer So Handy is the packaging, at least my machine's iteration. This one came with the original box and instructions manual, as well as the broken off seam gauge, a screwdriver to remove the needle, a couple of clamps that don't belong to this machine, a needle threader, and a needle case. One of these clamps, I believe, is a replacement part that the owner bought, as it's a crinkle finish and not black like the machine. All of these parts besides the needle threader and the clamps probably came with the original, as there's a picture inside the instructions manual of what comes with it. Bit of a tangent, but speaking of the instructions manual, my copyright 1953 version is definitely the most detailed that I've seen. Because of its length, it has time to bridge clarity and ease to detail, which I feel like nobody has done in an instructions manual for all of human history. It provides extremely clear instructions on maintenance, threading, and even sewing techniques like seam finishing and shirring. I'd love to make something using the information in this instructions manual, but most of it's for dolls and my 2010's broken, which I'll discuss later. Feel free to pause and read through it, no matter what model you have, as it's pretty applicable to all of them. In the early 60s, Singer had a court battle with another company over them selling toy sewing machines under the name So Easy, suspiciously similar to So Handy. I wouldn't have thought this important enough to include, but it was nearly the only mention of Singer Model 20s in governmental record books, now digitized online, and accounted for about half of my Google Books search results. Must have been a pretty big deal, though I don't really understand court vocabulary, so I wouldn't be able to tell you why. After the production of the Singer 2010 ceased, they tried to bring back the Model 20 in the 70s, the 1926 design, but these were stamped with Made in Turkey, so watch out for that if you're looking to purchase one. I find it kind of sad how the 2010 didn't have the longest of runs, and the 70s revival wasn't too successful either, but I guess that's to be expected with the changing social norms and culture of 1960s and 70s America. It's also possible that there were safety concerns, but that's just a personal theory of mine. Although these little machines probably wouldn't succeed nowadays either, though I, myself, can find no fault at all in them, I find it fascinating how they taught generations of kids to sew for over 50 years, and in my opinion, their story is worth remembering outside of collector circles. I tried to lean on the historical side of things for the first part of the video, who knows how well I did, but it is very important to talk about the troubleshooting and maintenance of these machines as they are used and pretty old. 
The greatest resource to me has been the SoHandy instructions manual, though I did turn to the internet and figure out some stuff by myself. Alright, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is the um, commonly missing pieces from these machines. First being the seam gauge. So this one came off a Singer So Handy, and this obviously is a Model 20, but I'll just be using it for demonstration purposes. So they go right there, and there'd be a screw going in um, that would slide along here and go in here. On this machine, the screw happens to be missing, uh, so I would be able to go and replace that if I wanted to. There are plenty of eBay shops that sell replacements. But yeah, that's likely to be missing because obviously it's detachable. Um, and I'd assume that many people wouldn't even sew with these because like it's such a little machine, you could just estimate it by eye, your seam allowance. Another thing that's likely to be missing, it's not a huge deal, but beneath the spool of thread, there would be a felt circle here. My Sew Handy has one of those, this one does not. Of course, that it's not a huge deal because it's literally just a circle of felt. It's not gonna have any impact on your sewing. I assume you'd be able to replace that, but it's not really so essential. Speaking of felt, another piece that is commonly missing is the felt on the bottom here. Now on this machine, I'm very glad it's there, but it is in rough condition. So if you have trypophobia, maybe, um. Skip ahead like 15 seconds. Yeah, so there's the felt. As you can see, it's not in great condition. So um, I like to keep this machine on a piece of parchment paper to keep it from getting damaged by any surface I place the machine on. My Singer So Handy does not have the felt attached. You could see a bit of felt residue, I guess, sticking there. Uh, it's just like little green fuzz. You're probably not able to see that. Again, not a huge deal. It does not impede sewing at all. Another commonly missing piece is the handle here on the turn wheel. Fun fact, um, in many of the boxes that these machines came in, you had to unscrew the hand wheel to put it back in the box. So um, that's another piece that commonly got lost, you know, uh, as you can expect. Like all the pieces, you're able to buy replicas of these and you can attach them to your machine if you'd like to sew with it. And the last commonly missing piece is the clamp. This one isn't absolutely necessary for sewing, but if you're sewing, more than just like a small swatch where you could just hold it to the table and sew. Um, it's definitely helpful to have a clamp. This one is broken. I believe I've shown it to you before. I'm filming this section ahead of time, so I don't exactly know. Oh yeah, also don't invest in a clamp if um, you don't have a suitable table to use. Like all of my tables have drawers right beneath the edge or something like that, so it can easily clamp. But you know, then again, I don't really use these machines to sew. They're just mostly uh, decorative and I only use them to sew small swatches. All right, next topic, accessories that may be helpful to you if you own one of these machines. So first we have this little screwdriver thing. Um, this one came with the Singer So Handy. Obviously that one's the most complete out of all the machines I have. What it's used for is unscrewing this screw right here, which lets the needle out. This is the one that comes with the machines, but I assume you could just use a regular screwdriver to unscrew that if you don't have one. Another thing you may want are 24 by one needles. These are widely available today. You should have no trouble finding them. This one again came with the Singer So Handy, and this may have been the original needles that came with it. It's empty and I have no replacements. I don't sew with these machines a ton, so I don't expect needing them, but I can always get them if I need. And the difference between these needles and regular needles is that they're flat on one side instead of being completely round like modern needles. And you insert the flat side into a certain side of this piece. Um, I don't remember exactly which one. Which brings me to my next point, which are instruction manuals. Definitely helpful if you can't remember which way to insert the needle or anything else like that. Um, they sell replicas. You've probably seen me taking pictures from them throughout this video. I bought this one in like a four pack for all of my machines. So as you can see, this one right here is 1926. So this one corresponds with this machine and the vast majority of machines that you'll find. This one is 1913, so the earliest one. It features the four wheel hand spoke, as you can see right there. This one is from 1914. I assume that's an eight spoke. This instruction manual is an early so handy one, so it's a lot shorter than the one that I've been showing you throughout the video. But if you can, get this manual. 
it's the best one. It has the most information. It's the most detailed. Gives you a bunch of um, extra information as well. So if you can get this one, if you can't, these are great as well. They'll provide you with everything you need to know. One helpful thing you'll be able to find in here is how to oil your machine. This one, of course, provides a very detailed picture of exactly where the oil. But in case you're not able to find this one, I'll show you right now wherever you need to oil. Again, helpful thing to have, sewing machine oil. Before I show you where the oil, I've never used an oil bottle before, and something I did not know is that you're supposed to use a pin to puncture a hole in the top. You're not supposed to try and pry off this red thing. So it may sound really stupid, but um, make sure you do that. I already oiled the machine recently, so I won't be doing it again, but I'll point out where you want to oil. So obviously, remove the thread. You'll want to oil right here where this needle bar moves against this piece, as you can see. Second place is um, in between this wheel and the hand wheel. You'll also want to hit with a drop of oil. And at the bottom of the machine with the um, louver mechanism, also want to oil that. Pretty self-explanatory spots. However, if you have just received your machine, it would be smart to clean it before you oil it. I don't know if there's like a proper way to do this, but basically what I did was I took um, Q-tips, not wet or anything, I just gently rubbed um, all the areas where I thought dirt would accumulate, and I did get a significant amount of dirt off. So make sure you get in the presser foot here, there's a lot of dirt there. Inside of the tension disc uh, also may be a little bit rusted and dirty and you want to clean that so that the thread tension isn't messed with. You also may want to wipe down the louver mechanism in case it has any old oil on it. Same thing goes for inside of the hand wheel here and along this bar at the bottom, oil accumulates as well. Of course, also just going over all of the other parts of the machine that may have accumulated surface dirt. If there were any spots you couldn't get to with the Q-tip, um, I just took a wooden skewer like this one and just gently rubbed it against whatever spot to get try and get some of the dust and dirt off of it. Of course, being gentle with it. I'd also like to address common problems you may run into um, while trying to make these machines sew. So. so the first one is that um, your tension screw, it may be a little bit rusted inside. And if you think that it's meshing with the tension way too much, like it's not doing its job because there's just too much friction, you could just um, have the thread bypass it altogether and try that maybe. Because, you know, as we saw before, the original four spoked machines had no tension screw at all, and some versions of the Model 24 did not as well. If you're having problems with the thread getting like all looped up and jammed and not releasing as it's supposed to around this looper mechanism, you may be able to try using a thinner fabric. So this machine at first did not want to sew until I used a rayon chali under it and then it worked a little bit better. Another common problem is this one is addressed in quite a lot of videos. But um, the reason this lock stitch is able to work is because in every position besides the highest position of the needle, this mechanism here is locking the thread, so no thread can go in or out for tension purposes. However, when we raise the needle to its highest position, as you can see, it just barely opens and the thread is able to pass through again. And as you'll be able to see on this one, the reason it's being raised is because when the needle reaches its highest position, as you can see, it just barely nudges that piece up. Can't really see it on the sew handies because again, they covered all that stuff up with aluminum, but it's just nice to know how it works. That is a common issue to have, though that hasn't happened to any of my machines, so I'm not exactly sure how you would go about fixing that. So yeah, that's pretty much all the stuff I wish I knew when I got these machines. Now I guess I'll go through all my machines one by one, because they do all have little personalities. Um, you know, like what's broken, what works, what's a little sticky, what they came with, and it's actually really interesting. Alright, so this machine was my first machine. Um, you haven't seen her before because she is very broken. We love her nonetheless though. She is full of character and I'd love to get her restored one day. So this one is the same time frame as the other Model 20 that I've shown you. Seven spool hand wheel, numbers printed along the thread guides. And this one came with a bunch of like random odds and ends. Like here's a Coates and Clark's um, old wooden spool and a tape measure, which probably isn't very old at all. But uh, these things, they look pretty, even though they're 
probably pretty much trash. So I kept some. I had to write down all of the pieces she was missing. But um, it is missing the uh, hand wheel, which I could easily get a replacement for. The spool holder, which again, another part that's easy to replace. The presser foot lever, which it's still functional, but um, you know on the other one how there's like a presser foot lever here and it raises the presser foot. You still are able to raise this presser foot. You just have to pull it up from the top. It's also missing the needle screw. And inside here is a broken needle, uh, but it's rusted inside. So I'm not sure how I would remove that. So like there's nothing holding in there but rust. And like I've tried tugging on it, it doesn't come out very easily. It's missing the seam allowance gauge, which isn't a huge deal, the clamp as well. And it's missing the felt on the bottom and the felt on the top. That's to be expected. A lot of the screws are a little bit loose. Uh, that would be pretty easy to tighten up though. This tension screw is extremely rusted, not just on the inside, but also uh, this screw here, like it won't move. Um, but all I've tried using is my hand, so maybe like um, some sort of tool would help there. If we come around to the top of the machine, we can see that this piece right here is completely crooked. And the reason it's crooked is because these two pieces are bent. They're supposed to be straight up, you know? But I like to keep it crooked because at certain angles, if you keep it like this, um, you're, you are able to spin the hand wheel. It actually spins like super well, but that's because there's literally no resistance because all of the parts are missing or broken or bent or not functioning as they're supposed to. So yeah, I'd say the biggest problem with this machine is that these two pieces right here are bent. I know like nothing about metal, so I don't know if you would be able to bend those back into shape without using like heat or something. Um, if anyone knows, feel free to tell me. This piece does snap back into place uh, where it's supposed to sit. It's just that now these are bent and touching each other, so it can't spin anymore. So yeah, I'd love to get this one restored one day. Um, if not by a professional, then maybe figure out how to do it myself, because I'd love to see it working again. I mean, like, yeah, the parts are a little rusted, but the body's in fine condition. And if these were unbent, um, you would be able to coax it into working, I think. Also something to note, um, a small inconsistency between this machine and the other machine is that um, this axle along the bottom is painted black, whereas on the other machine it was left silver. I don't doubt, besides the, um, the three major versions of the Model 20, that there weren't like small differences as the years went by. This machine is the machine that you've been seeing throughout the video, and that's because um, it's the only singer that actually works. I got this one at an antique store, so I was considering the possibility that it had already been restored, but some things just don't match up. Like when I was cleaning this, it was quite dirty, which you would think that would be something that they would have um, fixed when they re were restoring it. This screw is really tight uh, for the stitch length gauge, so uh, that again, I would think would have been an easy fix. And um, some places are really shiny and not rusted at all in, in great condition, but this piece right here is quite rusted. And you would think if they polished the other pieces, they would have done that one as well. So yeah, it comes with a felt, as I said, from 1926 to 1948, 50, whatever the year was, and it works very well. So unfortunately, we had to change away from our aesthetic filming location, but that's because this machine just came with so much cool stuff that I wanted to show you guys. So um, let's start with the machine itself. I'll insert a video, but as I've probably alluded to, this machine does not work. Um, I honestly really wish it did because of everything it comes with, but unfortunately it does not. So this looper mechanism here, it kind of just like doesn't grab the thread for some reason. Like as it turns, the thread creates the loop as it's supposed to, but this piece right here that's supposed to grab it, it just barely misses it. At first I thought maybe it just needed like oil or something like that, but um, I oiled it and um, nothing really happened. So that's this one's main flaw. It's in great condition otherwise though. The only thing that um, I guess would be wrong with it is where the seam gauge is supposed to go. Um, the screw broke off and we can't really do much to replace it because it's broken off inside of the hole. But you know, that's not a huge deal because we, we have the original, so as long as we have it, I don't see a huge problem with that. 
So now we can start moving into the really cool stuff, which is the um, packaging and all the things that came with it. Here is the box in which it came. Overall, the box is in pretty good condition. It's just like peeling a little bit, but that's to be expected. Uh, colors are very bright and vivid, which is great. So basically when I was looking at pictures online, you typically see two boxes, one that looks like this and one that um, is definitely more like late 50s into the 60s. This one is post-1953, as seen in the instructions manual, but probably not too far into the late 50s or 60s. And here's the instructions manual. Um, I assume I've showed you already, but as you can see, there is a bit of damage here. That's not a huge deal though, because as we've already established, this is the best instructions manual in the history of mankind. So um, nothing about it can make me dislike it. As you can see here, it says, Copyright USA 1953 by the Singer Manufacturing Company. All rights reserved for all countries. All right, let's read this paragraph here. Your Singer sewing machine is a sturdy, dependable one designed especially for you. The threading points are marked, the adjustments for tension and stitch length are simple, and the presser foot acts as a finger guard to protect your fingers from coming in contact with the needle. This is a real machine, not a toy. Using this machine, you will learn the basic principles of machine sewing, first making your dollies clothes and perhaps small gift articles, then your own play clothes, shorts, pinafores, skirts, and clothes for your little sister. You'll want to take your machine with you on vacations with the family, weekend visits with friends, and finally to college. Ever ready for mending or making a simple garment. And on this page, it shows everything the machine is supposed to come with, most of which we have, and I could show you right now. So we have the Singer Needles, which I showed you already, it's empty, which shows you the machine was used and loved, which I love to see. Then, which we've already seen, we have the um, screwdriver for the needle. We've also got the uh, seam allowance gauge, which I've already showed you several times. Not part of it, but we get a really nice needle threader. This one is considerably more sturdy than the, than the ones we get nowadays. Like, it's not gonna break if you use it like once. And then we get two random clamps that have nothing to do with Singer at all. I don't really know why they included them, but you know, that that's fine. And lastly, we have the broken replacement in the crinkle finish. I think right now we'll try and recreate the picture on the page with all of the stuff we have. I think that would be interesting. So yeah, here's our Singer So Handy as pictured. Um, the only thing from the original that we don't have is the original spool of thread. But, you know, that's to be expected. Thread is meant to be used. <laughs> and I got this one on eBay, by the way. So while filming close-up shots of this machine, I realized why it doesn't sew. If you look carefully at the looper mechanism, you can see the very tip is broken off, so it's unable to hook the thread. That's something that you probably wouldn't see by just looking at the machine in pictures online or something, so I think I just got unlucky with this purchase. So lastly, we have this um, Junior Miss sewing machine. This one is obviously not a Singer, not one of the Model 20s or the Sew Handies or any of their iterations. This was a knockoff. The reason why I like this knockoff is because it looks quite different from the other ones. Like a lot of them look exactly like um, the Singers or they look just like really cheap in general, but this one is not. So it's in very good condition, working condition. It has all of its parts besides maybe the clamp, but we'll address that later. It does open up on the bottom, which I'll do, though it's a tiny bit difficult, um, so that you can see the innards. So as you can see, the mechanism is the exact same as the Singer. It just has this chain here, which is a tiny bit different. As you can see, when I turn it, it works just like the Singer. I try not to open it very much because um, I don't want to damage it as it's quite difficult to open. And when I received it, the seller said that it hadn't been used in like 50 years, which is to be expected. Um, and they weren't sure if it worked, but it looked to be in great condition and it came with a lot of things. So I had high hopes, um, but when I got it, it, it didn't work, which was very sad. But I had forgotten how you could open up these and only until I was doing research on this one and um, I saw eBay listings of them open then that I realized that that's like something you can do. So I did and I found um, a whole bunch of like thick white thread knotted around the looper. So I just removed that and then now it works. Before I do a demonstration, I'll show you how to thread it. This one, as I said, came with a lot of stuff, which we'll go through in a second, but here's the instructions manual and I'm just going to use this to thread the machine. 
So first we're going to want to go through these two eyelets. And of course, this is much like the singers and much like modern machines. So yeah, here's our machine all threaded. This machine stitch is a lot longer than the singers. And um, I don't believe there's a way to change the stitch length. It's not a huge problem because it's, you could tell it's a cheaper machine than the singers were. So yeah, as you can see, the machine sews really well. Fastening off the thread is just like the other ones. Just kind of wiggle that. And um, here's our stitch. The chain is a little bit uneven, but that's a tension thing. And um, I don't really feel like messing with that right now. It just produces a really nice long stitch. Another thing about this machine itself is that this screw on the um, seam gauge is a little bit tight. So if you try and move this, the paint starts to chip. And I wasn't able to find a ton of information online on like the Singer about like the history of this machine or anything like that. But um, because we have nearly every single piece of packaging, we know a lot about this machine in particular. This here, I know it's a little bit large, is the original box. And this machine was owned by a woman named Janice and it was sold on eBay by her husband. So here's the box. And on the bottom, it says Connecticut Container Corp. And it says Wallingford, Connecticut, 46. I assume the 46 stands for 1946. Um, that would make the most sense given what I've read online. Janice's husband on eBay said that it was likely uh, late 40s, early 50s. And all the listings I've seen online say 1940s. So that makes a lot of sense. Also, um, the Connecticut part of this, there were a couple variations of the Junior Miss, one of which kind of has like a raised base. Um, I'll sh try and find a picture of that for you. And um, it has like a decal of where it was made and it says New Haven, Connecticut, I believe. I can't exactly remember, but Connecticut matches up pretty well. Another piece that this came with is the original tag. As you can see, it's a little worse for wear. That's why I keep it in this plastic. By the way, I keep all of these like um, instructions, manuals, and other things in archival plastic bags, but I have all my machines on display in case you were wondering how I was storing them. I was able to find more complete pictures online of this label, which um, we could take a look at. And this machine costs 750. And we know because it's written on the box here, 750 and on the bottom of the machine in the same handwriting. And also Janice's husband did say it cost 750 at the time. I did take into consideration that maybe that box wasn't an original as it doesn't have like the, um, it's more of like a shipping box. There's no uh, like branding or anything like the singers had, but I think just like so much matches up like the Connecticut thing and the 750 that it's probably the same and the 46, you know, right time period. And as we can see on the label here, uh, it was made by TG Metal Industries. Uh, I looked into them online. There isn't a ton of information. I recently discovered Google Books, which is my new favorite thing. Basically you just like type in a keyword and it searches this massive library of uh, government and also like magazines and just scanned books for uh, matches. They did appear a couple times in like court documents and and things i don't really know they seem to be like a toy company with an emphasis on amateur boating that seems kind of weird but <laughs> that's what they did i found a couple ads and then there's their sewing machine venture i haven't found an ad for one of these but quite a few of them exist like on eBay and whatever. So probably one of the bigger toy sewing machines. I also found an eBay listing of another sewing machine, like one of those cheap varieties of toy sewing machines that they claimed was made by TG, which I, I wouldn't doubt to be true. Oh, I also found an ad for a toy telephone that they made. So yeah, like metal toys, it was their thing. So yeah, that's this machine. It was actually so much fun putting together the pieces of this machine because of like all the pieces of information we had and I, I had the fun of putting it together along with um, research online, which was a lot of fun. Sorry if this wasn't very 
concise. <laughs> I've been filming for the uh, like two or three hours and I'm not used to talking for so long. But yeah, this little machine, even though it isn't like a singer or, or any sort of brand name, I still think it's really interesting looking at the history and um, things like that. Wait, actually, wait, this clamp. Guys, doesn't that look a tiny bit familiar? One second. Yeah, uh, this was the one that came from the Singer So Handy as just like random accessories. Um, I'm gonna see if it fits in the hole. It actually does, but it's a tiny bit loose. I mean, like, to be honest with you, it's probably not a clamp that would have gone with one of these machines, but I guess that's cool. <laughs> So there you have it, a brief history of the Singer Model 20, as well as some troubleshooting points and my collection. All my sources, Google Books with advertisements, and interesting pictures that I couldn't use for copyright reasons will be linked below if you'd like to learn more. If you're having problems not addressed in this video, the internet is a wonderful resource and somebody will surely be able to help you. Again, if you owned one of these machines as a kid, I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. I know this was a bit different, but I hope you enjoyed the video, and feel free to subscribe for plenty of vintage sewing, crochet, and sock plushie content. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time!